there we go. So just so you know, we are recording this, so um, we can share this with you later, or I know there's a few people who are interested who could not be here tonight, so we are recording it so that they can watch it later. Um, we're gonna ask that you mute yourselves unless you're talking. Um, Bethany has asked if you could just um, save your questions for the end and just like throw them in the chat box as they come up. And I will moderate that chat box and at, at the end of the presentation, there'll be plenty of time for some questions and answers. So I'm just going to turn it over to Bethany. All right, fabulous, Tamara. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for having me here tonight on behalf of the Sharon Audubon Center here in Sharon, Connecticut. I'm thrilled to be here speaking on a topic that I think a lot of people have taken up a really generous amount of interest in given uh, the pandemic this past year. I think a lot of us have been spending more time outdoors and paying attention to one of the most prominent animals that many of us see outdoors, which is birds. And so today we are going to be going through how we can start to better identify some of the birds that we are seeing in our backyards or in public spaces, parks, those kinds of areas, and um, learn about some of these really common birds that are taking up residence in our homes. So let's go ahead and get a sneak peek into some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I should also mention too that uh, I, Zoom seems to be experiencing some sort of glitch tonight, so I am not at, able to access my notes for certain parts of the presentation. Um, and so if I suddenly remember some interesting fact that I wanted to mention about birds or a specific species uh, somewhere further down in the presentation, I will be sure to mention it at the end if I feel that it's relevant. All right. All right, there we go. We're again, Zoom seems to be a little sticky tonight, so a little slow in advancing. So hopefully that goes away. So in tonight's presentation, we're going to be kind of learning about a few terms to start us off, um, looking at things uh, regarding migrant and resident. What does it mean for a bird species to be a migrant uh, versus a resident? And can a bird be both? We're then, like I mentioned earlier, going to be taking a look at some of those field marks or characteristics that we can begin to pull from our birds to be able to differentiate them from one another. Uh, we're then going to look at some of these early birds that were coming into us during the springtime. Uh, they are birds that we do see frequently in various different environments that many of us are likely already familiar with, but there could be one or two that are new to folks here on the presentation. So we will uh, talk a little bit more in depth about some of the interesting features um, and bits of natural history about those species. Uh, we're then going to talk a little bit about how we can help birds at home via planting native plants in our yards and taking up other conservation actions on their behalf. Um, and then last but not least, we are going to talk a little bit about the asset that we have here at the Sharon Audubon Center, which is one of the features making us unique, which is our wildlife rehabilitation clinic and how that plays into bird conservation. I will do my very best to try to leave a little space of about five or so minutes at the end for any questions that come through uh, the chat or for folks to take themselves off mute and ask me at that point. All right, so hopefully everybody is good to go. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So when we talk about birds being migrants or residents, those are terms to really help us to get an understanding essentially of whether birds are here year round, like our residents are, or whether they are uh, migrant species here only during the breeding season in the spring and summer, and then flying elsewhere to their wintering grounds during the remainder of the year. So if we take a look at the right-hand side of the screen, this is our black cat chickadee, our only chickadee species here in the state of Connecticut. And this species is here year around, right? So we see it and we hear it in the springtime. We're fortunate enough to have it rear its young with us during those months. Um, but then we're hearing it in the fall. We're seeing it a lot during the wintertime too, especially if we're putting out seed at our feeders in the winter. These chickadees, they burn a lot of calories during the day and especially during the nighttime as they're shivering, trying to stay warm in those winter months here. So um, can be really helpful to put out bird feeders for them. And they're just really a joy to see at those feeders during those months. So again, those are our resident bird species. Then on the left-hand side of the screen, we have representing our migrant species, our tree swallow. So if any of you folks out there put up bird boxes for Eastern bluebirds, you probably know or have seen that tree swallows will take up residence in those same size boxes as well. And in fact, in the bluebird boxes that we have here on site at the Sharon Audubon Center, uh, we do have quite a few pairs of tree swallows that have taken up residence. But again, because these particular birds are aerial insectivores and dependent on insect prey to be able to sustain themselves and their young, um, they are migrating southward all the way down to parts of South America 
actually to be able to spend uh, those winter months where they are able to find that insect prey base for them. So if we just take a look at these range maps here, we could just see what that looks like, right, in, in a different kind of visual. So we can see again for a year round resident, our black capped chickadee, that they are color purple all throughout their range throughout North America, right? They're not really going anywhere during the winter months. Tree swallow, on the other hand, we can see where they're breeding up in the top half of the United States and into Canada and parts of Alaska. Um, but then again, for their wintering grounds, they're flying all the way to Central America and to islands off of the coast of Florida, um, and then some populations even going deeper into South America there. So we get this question a lot at the center actually about birds being able to be both migrants and residents, right? And the short answer is yes, some bird species can be both, but it really depends on where that species, where those birds are located within their range. So American robins are a really great example of a bird species here in Connecticut that can be both a migrant and a resident, right? Because some uh, North American robins will uh, come down from Canada and actually spend the winter with us because it's just slightly more mild than those brutalizing winters up in Canada. Um, but many of our robins will stay within just a few miles of where they might've been hanging out and breeding in our backyards, again, here in Connecticut. Right, so again, we have some of those birds that are coming south here from parts further north, but we have many of the robins in Connecticut actually staying put here, uh, again, very close to where they were breeding during the spring and the summer. Right, so again, that's a great example of a bird that can be both, but again, it just depends on where those populations are located within the range. So now let's uh, take a look at some of the things that we can start to pull apart when we're talking about identifying birds in general. This is a really great graphic that I love for a couple of different reasons. Um, first, I love it because it's really visually appealing. It's really beautiful. And I especially love that these birds are differentiated by families. Um, you can't really see it because of the vastness of this graphic and the, the small nature of the text in there, but these birds actually are grouped into their respective families. Um, so we have uh, this kind of funny name referring to uh, birds like whippoorwills and nighthawks as goat suckers, right, and their relatives. We have them here. We have owls located here. Uh, we have various kinds of large wading birds here, uh, warblers, vireos, and so on and so forth, right? So this is a really uh, lovely poster that I'd be happy to include the link to so that you can purchase this and hang this in a beautiful frame in your house if you would like uh, at the end of the presentation. But I also like it um, because it's a wonderful teaching tool too. So when people are first starting to bird, um, I really like to recommend that people start learning birds by their respective families, because it is really intimidating to start just looking at birds out in the wild, grabbing a field guide and trying to identify what specific bird that is. Especially when we only see birds oftentimes for a few seconds at a time, right? It can be a really intimidating exercise to just try to remember those specific colors, those markings, the size, and then flip through page after page trying to ID it. And so again, um, I really encourage people to start familiarizing themselves with bird families um, so that they can at least start to then become more familiar with those types of characteristics associated with those families. So that can be a more realistic starting point when starting to ID a bird that you see out in the wild, right? If you can at least identify like, hey, I'm pretty sure that was a sparrow that I saw that's a much less intimidating place to start at than saying, ah, I saw this bird, it was small, it was grayish, ah, where do I even start to, to ID that, right? So again, families can be really important. And especially because in the states of New York and Connecticut, we have several hundred bird species, um, you know, that we're fortunate enough to be able to enjoy at various points during the year. So again, um, really starting at the family level can be much less intimidating than starting to identify birds one by one. So when we talk about then getting into the nitty gritty of actually identifying individual birds, right? We are looking at these things that we refer to as field marks, these specific characteristics that tell us a lot about a bird that we're looking at. So if we start looking at these six uh, various field marks that I have listed here, again, that can really tell us some really quality information about the bird that we're seeing. So the first bullet point there, if we look at the bird's plumage, it's feathers. Right? That can tell us a lot about a bird. That can tell us, um, you know, that can indicate specific markings on feathers because oftentimes we can see, you know, um, 
markings on the breast and the belly, like we can see on my bird here, which I am not going to reveal the identity of. I'm going to have you guys tell me once we go through these characteristics, if anybody knows, right? So we can see sometimes these markings, right, in the forms of dots, splotches, striations on the belly and the breast that can be distinctive from other species, right? The overall color um, is oftentimes situated or uh, is, is matched to the habitat that the bird resides in, right? But it can also differentiate male and female, particularly when we're talking about songbirds, right? We oftentimes recognize our males as being more flashy and, and much more conspicuous than the female who is oftentimes more muted so that she's more camouflaged um, in the nest. But it's not just the colors of the feathers that we're looking at when we're talking about plumage as a field mark. Um, birds might also have special groupings of feathers that set them apart as a species. If you take a northern cardinal, for example, and um, we see that little grouping of feathers that kind of looks like a mohawk on top, that's referred to as a crest. And not all birds have that, right? Few birds in this region actually have that that we can think of. A northern cardinal, tufted titmouse, cedar waxwing. Those are a few that have, again, that special grouping of feathers um, that set them apart for other birds. So again, that also can be distinctive when we're talking about plumage. Uh, when we're talking about the size of a bird, we can communicate that to you know, other birders in a couple of different ways. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about because we ask people about this all the time when they call our center and they have a bird that they found in the wild that they want to admit to our wildlife rehab clinic. Right, so they'll say, you know, the, we'll ask, uh, is the bird softball size? Is it golf ball size? You know, is it like football size? That's a really useful one, right? So we can get an understanding if the bird is football size, maybe it's about the size of an American crow. Or, you know, contrarily, if it's golf ball size, maybe we're thinking more of something like house wren or a chickadee or, you know, tough to titmouse, small type of songbird, right? So we can communicate size using those types of metrics. Um, or we can use other bird species that we're familiar with to be able to uh, communicate the rough size of that bird. You know, so maybe if you are familiar with an American crow, um, a bird that you're trying to describe um, to another birder or trying to remember for your own sake, if you're looking up the bird later, uh, that might be helpful um, as a size reference for you. So again, there are a couple of ways that we can communicate that. But again, size is important in our birds because we know that they come in all sorts of different sizes. When we're talking about the structure of our birds out in the wild, um, we're really talking about the shape here. What kind of a shape does this bird have? And now we think about birds having a general sort of you know, mold that they come in. Um, but in this particular species, uh, a shape that I would focus in on would be this really long tail that it has, right? We know that all birds have tails to help them to be able to balance and be able to steer properly when they're flying. Um, but not all tails are the same. Some birds have really stubby tails that they don't really utilize all that much. A lot of our owl species have very stubby tails. Um, but our songbirds uh, tend to have a varying, varying sizes when it comes to tails. And again, this, would, this feature would be a shape that would stand out to me in this particular bird if I were looking at that long tail, right? But also this long and kind of curved bill would be something that I would notice too. Um, so again, when talking about structure, really talking about some shapes that we can pull apart in our birds there. Um, behavior is a, an especially helpful field mark when we are getting into the spring season, right? Because in spring, we know that our birds are coming back. They're starting to select independent territories. And in doing those things, they're starting to select their mates too and trying to court their mates so that they can build families during the summertime, right? So we see a lot of interesting behaviors displayed among species, especially when it comes to courtship or male courting female. And so with this particular species, uh, the male bird will actually present the female with some kind of nest building material in hopes to woohoo over and convince her that he is a suitable father um, and partner in their partnership in rearing young. Since this bird, the male will stick around and not only help and build the nest, but also help rear the young over the course of the spring and the summer months. Um, so this bird, again, the male will oftentimes present the female with a twig or um, a clump of several blades of, gla blade, blades of grass, <laughs> there we go, um, again, to try to convince the female that he is a suitable suitor. Um, habitat, right? So we know that birds have evolved to be able to occupy very specific habitats in which they're able to thrive. We know that birds occupy habitats in every environment that we can think of, right? If anybody has ever seen planet Earth, we know that birds thrive in Arctic zones, in tundras, in coastal areas. We know that they thrive in deserts and forests and swamps and river bottomlands. 
virtually, again, every environment that we can think of, we can probably think of several bird species that are well adapted to be able to fit those environments, right? So that's, um, that's a really helpful characteristic for me when I'm thinking about a bird, because if I see something unusual in an environment, um, I have to remember to think of the habitat and think, okay, would this bird be found in this particular habitat or not? You know, would it be found in a scrubby habitat versus a more open habitat or a more heavily wooded habitat? And so when we start thinking about birds that way, again, that can just be a really helpful field mark that maybe is the breaking point between one species or another when we're trying to figure out who's who. Um, and last but not least, uh, this season, we are especially fortunate to be able to hear a lot of bird song. Uh, if any of you guys are ever out birding in the early springtime when birds are starting to come back and stake out those territories, it is just an absolute cacophony in those early morning hours with all of these birds singing their hearts out for hours and hours and hours, um, again, in hopes of being able to secure productive territories to be able to rear their young in, right? So again, um, song is an especially distinctive field mark when it comes to bird species. Now, within families, we can oftentimes observe similar songs within songbirds, but that song is going to be specific to each bird species, right? Even if we can detect similarities within a family. So for example, in the wren family, we can find similarities between the song of a house wren and a Carolina wren. But again, when we compare and contrast those two songs, there are some very distinct differences between them. I'm going to go ahead and play you the song of this bird that I have on my screen here because this species is actually the world's master songster. Being able to memorize and incorporate up to 2,000 distinctive songs into its repertoire during its lifetime. So let's give this a listen. <laughs> All right, so now, da -da -da -da, the moment has arrived. I want you guys to go ahead and put it in the chat. What species of bird you think this is or you know this to be? This bird is not a common species, I will say here in Northwestern Connecticut, although we can find it in two locations in Litchfield County. Um, we can find it at White Memorial and Bantam Lake. Uh, this bird does tend to favor scrubby habitats. And so as you know, this corner of the state has had a lot of these forests regenerate and grow up. We've lost a lot of that scrubby habitat that it prefers. And so we just don't see it um, as abundantly here in this corner. So let's go ahead and see if anybody knew it. All right, we got a couple of guesses here. Uh, Phoebe or a type of sparrow. Those are good guesses because it does have a sort of shape that a Phoebe has and it has coloration that a sparrow has. Um, this is actually a, let's see if my computer responds, <laughs> a little sluggish here. I'll hold you in suspense. All right, so that's our brown thrasher. All right, so this bird is what is referred to as a mimid, which means that it is a relative of the great catbird and of the northern mockingbird. All species who are able to um, memorize all sorts of songs and calls and even human made sounds and incorporate them into their song repertoire. All right, so now I'm gonna give you guys the opportunity to go ahead and give me some notes on these field marks that we just went over. So let's go ahead and take them one by one here. Let's start with plumage, right? So again, I'm not gonna reveal the identity of this particular species here, um, but we're gonna go ahead and do that after you guys have given me some observations on these six field marks. So what do you notice about the feathers of this particular species of bird that I have in my slide here? What might stand out to you if you were to take notes on this in the field or if you were to try to communicate this to somebody else? Soft, yeah, it looks really soft. And that's actually important for this bird in its state of development, right? So this would be a really good piece of information to know if I had you on the phone and I was trying to get an understanding of if this bird was an adult or if this was a juvenile bird. So soft feathers is important there. What else? Fluffy, fuzzy looking. Yeah, right. So really talking about kind of the texture of that. Yes. Yeah. So again, that's helpful to note um, for that specific stage of development for this particular bird. Right. But we also can see, you guys see these little tufts here at the top? They're not as evident right now because this bird is indeed a juvenile, right? You guys already indicated the softness of these feathers. Their adult feathers haven't quite come in yet. And we still have this natal down here. 
but we also have the beginnings of these tufts that will be much more prominent on the top of the bird's head as it grows older. So that would be another good field mark to know because there are only two species of this particular group of birds here in Northwestern Connecticut that would have that particular grouping of feathers at the top of the head. So now our next field mark is size, right? So what would you be able to tell me about the size looking at the slide? It's kind of hard, of course, because we're not seeing these birds in real life to get, um, you know, to be able to scale it accurately. But what might you tell me about the size of this bird that you're looking at right now? If I were to be looking at it in the wild, it would look to me um, really like a couple of footballs put together, <laughs> stacked on top of one another, right? That might be accurate to describe. Pretty big, yeah, right? So sizable. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, black cap chickadee. I'm not talking about a blue jay. I'm talking a bird about a bird that's much bigger, right? So I might even say larger than a crow or just a couple of footballs stacked on top of one another. And the structure, right? If we look at the shape of these birds, it's kind of an indistinct shape here, right? They kind of look like a couple of little blobs next to each other, but again, you know, this, these little tufts that are emerging at the top of their heads really help to break up their silhouette a little bit and give them, again, a distinction from other members of their particular family. So that would be another important note when we're talking about their structure, their shape. Behavior. So these birds right here are in a stage of development um, that in the industry we refer to as branchers. Uh, so these birds are being reared in what we call platform nests, right? So not a nest cavity, but a platform nest that is typically constructed by a hawk species um, that sits um, really close to the trunk of a tree, high up, usually in pine trees that are well shielded. Um, so as these birds grow and as they um, begin to learn how to fly, they're branching out and moving further and further away from their natal nest. Right? So we thus call them branchers because they're starting to move away from the nest, they're starting to stretch their wings and flex them and prepare to be on their own in a little while. But nothing, not everything goes smoothly in most cases. And so as these birds are practicing these skills they're going to need as adults, they sometimes do fall off those branches and down to the forest floor. Right? So we do get a lot of calls about birds in this particular stage of development in the brancher stage because it does worry a lot of people. They're not used to seeing this particular bird species on the forest floor on the ground. But these birds, believe it or not, if you look at their feet and you look at how big their feet are and how sharp their claws are, these birds are actually able to use those feet and climb straight up the trunk of the tree and back into that nest. Right, And so that um, you know, being a brancher, you know, kind of talking about maybe you found the bird on the forest floor at the base of a large tree. Um, that's helpful information when we're intaking animals because that tells us that, oh, you know, maybe there isn't anything wrong with this bird. And oftentimes there's not. Um, you know, sometimes we can't see fractures and things like that if they kind of twisted themselves a particular way when they fell or it was particularly high in the impact intense. Um, but oftentimes these birds, um, it's just a bit of a learning curve for them and they are fine and can navigate um, climbing up the trunk of that tree back to the nest, right? Uh, this particular species of bird is found in virtually every habitat across the United States. Um, it is the most widespread of its family. And so we can find it in deserts, in mountains, we can find it in swamps and in heavily wooded forests. Um, we can find it in um, sometimes even along the borders of fields and meadows and more open environments. And so again, this is a really ubiquitous species of its particular family. We can find it in all sorts of habitats. And last but not least, um, several of you, uh, if you are living up here in Northwestern Connecticut um, or bordering states where we have this um, really lovely, heavily wooded area, you might've heard this sound uh, piercing the night that maybe you didn't know what it was. So let's go ahead and give this a listen. Kind of a spooky sound, right? It can really throw people for a loop because oftentimes we want to say it's a mammal, you know, oftentimes people want to say, I think I heard a fox or maybe I heard, you know, a coyote, um, but that's actually the begging call 
of this particular bird again in the stage of development where it's not quite independent of its parents and still relying on them to be able to bring them food, right? So again, that's it's begging its parents to be able to give it a little snack at night. All right, so if anybody wants to go ahead and guess or if they know the species of this bird, I invite you to go ahead and put that in the chat at this time. It is, nice job, Frank. Yeah, so it is indeed a great horned owl looking very fuzzy again as a juvenile. And this should come up, but again, my Zoom just seems to be really lagging there. Oh, here we go, excellent. Yeah, so these birds again, this is a really common owl species that we have up here in Northwestern Connecticut. And we can hear the adults courting one another um, during the months of January, as early as January and into February. They have these really deep resounding, ooh, 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 those hoots that they emit. Um, so if you've heard that at night, um, congratulations, you have some great horned owls um, that are hanging out near you and possibly even nesting near you. So if we wanted to take it just one level deeper when we're talking about identifying our birds and talking about um, field marks regarding plumage in particular, we can really start to get more specific with some of the markings um, that are listed here. Notice that I only circled a few of these. I promise we're not gonna go through all of them and I'm certainly not going to give you a quiz at the end to see if you remembered all of them. Um, but let's just focus here briefly on the ones that I've circled. So we have the crown or the very top of the head on our birds and oftentimes does display some sort of marking. Um, we have here on my little illustration of our downy woodpecker, we have this being black at the top of the head, right? And for some woodpecker species uh, that can be red for both male and female, but in the case of the downy, um, we have the red that's located kind of further back on the crown with the black at the top. So again, we can have some color markings and distinctions that can be shown um, on this particular part of the bird's body. Um, here, we have a little bit of some dark coloration on my little Canada warbler here on the crown, um, but it's not super visible unless those are raised up, if the bird is alarmed or excited. Uh, if we look at the breast of our birds, I love this field marking again on the Canada warbler because ugh, for me, nothing really compares to this marking that we refer to as a necklace that sits so beautifully across the breast of this bird, right? Really distinguishing it from any other warbler uh, member of its family. Um, the only other one that would come close would be our magnolia warbler, but that warbler um, has markings and streaks along the flanks where my mouse is here. So along the side body and not in this distinctive necklace formation that we see on this bird here. Um, so the flanks, <laughs> it's a nice little segue. Uh, we can have um, some markings that we're gonna see in the next slide on some of our birds that again are distinctive um, across species, um, especially in a particular like, family such as warblers. Um, but the belly can also display some colorations that are memorable and that are distinctive. And believe it or not, this little group of feathers underneath the bird's tail, referred to as the undertail coverts, um, can sometimes be a, just an entire color. So if we think about a gray cat bird, their undertail coverts are kind of this rusty color, this kind of red orangish color, um, which is a really nice field mark to pull apart if you see that bird flying away from you and you're unsure what it is. Um, so again, those can sometimes be bright colors. Uh, the tail can sometimes display bands or a solid color on the top or on the underside, like we see in our downy woodpecker here, we have a nice black that sits on top. Um, but again, like I said, a lot of birds will display bands or uh, bars of color that go across the tail um, and sometimes even have um, different colors in the tail on the outsides that are visible from both the underside and the top side. Um, and last but not least, um, another common area that we find coloration on our birds or specific markings is the back of the neck or the nape. All right, so let's take a look and kind of do a little compare and contrast here between two species of warbler um, that we can see here in Northwestern Connecticut. I should say that we can only see this particular species during the early spring when they tend to come in groups and hang out. Uh, we do see them at the Sharon Audubon Center, uh, coming in these little flocks, hanging out at both the Sharon Audubon Center and at Miles Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, but we have this character here on the right-hand side of the screen, and we have this bird that breeds at both properties. And again, I'm not gonna reveal them until the very end and have you guys see if you are familiar with either of these species, right? But if we look at the crown first and foremost, um, we can tell that there are already some differences between the two species, right? We can see in this bird in the left, right? I have some yellow on the top of the head. So that stands out immediately compared 
to part of the black mask that my bird on the left has before it transitions into this kind of grayish brownish coloration. So if we look at the breast, right, that's another big difference in these birds. We have a really nice wash of yellow on my bird on the right hand side. Um, whereas we can see here, even though this bird isn't looking at us full on, we can see that there's some streaking that occurs on this bird's breast, right? We have white with some of those dark streaks that we can see. And then the belly, another common area where we see some coloration, right? That streaking continues. And on this bird here in this slide, we have uh, some markings on the flank or the side body, right? We have this really nice conspicuous yellow patch here um, with some nice black that borders it. We don't see that combination in any other part throughout the bird's body. So this would be a really distinctive field mark again on the flank. Um, and then in addition, we have this nice little yellow patch on the rump that occurs. And that's actually where this bird gets part of its common name. Um, and so then it's no mystery as to why this bird has a really fun nickname um, as a butter butt <laughs> because of that nice conspicuous yellow coloration, right? And then uh, again, contrasting with our bird on the right hand side, we have a really nice even wash where this yellow kind of really bleeds pretty seamlessly into this kind of grayish brown color without any of those streakings or conspicuous colorations on the flanks. Um, so again, we have some really key differences here. Uh, these two birds are members of the same family. And again, this bird is migrant species and continues to parts further north up into parts of Canada and Alaska to breed at high elevations in the alpine zone. Um, whereas this bird prefers, um, does hang around in Connecticut and really prefers areas that are wetter, right? So if you at your property, if you border a marsh or some kind of wetland, or even if you have a creek running through your property, with um, you know, some nice aquatic vegetation that borders it, you probably have this bird um, breeding nearby. Does anybody wanna take a stab at identifying um, either one or both of these birds that I have in my screen here? Oh, and of course, let me play you the song too, because again, um, we can hear that in the early spring and summer here. So let's go ahead and play this guy first. And I should note that even though these guys are moving through where we are in Northwestern Connecticut, these males are still singing. And so it is possible to hear that song, even if they aren't breeding here. Compared to this guy who will be singing all the time in these spring months when they start moving in on territory. That nice witchety, witchety, witchety. All right, let's see what we got in the chat. All right, yeah, Linda, nice. Yep, so we have yellow rumped warbler on the left. Very good, yep, named again for that yellow patch right on the rump there on the back end. And then on the right, we have a bird called the common yellow throat. All right, so we'll see if I can bring this up. There we go, yellow rumped warbler again, and then common yellow throat, right? So even though it's named for the solid yellow coloration on the throat, this bird is also defined by this really kind of bandit-esque <laughs> black mask that encircles the face. And so when I give this presentation in early spring, um, I like to mention these drive-by birds, right? These birds that are sticking around only for a few days at a time, usually before heading to their breeding territories um, way up in Northern Canada and in parts of Alaska. So we have our fox sparrow on the left who is defined by his general hugeness for the sparrow family. He's much larger than his cousins, such as the song sparrow and the junco and chipping sparrow, and has this really warm reddish coloration um, with this really conspicuous marking here on the breast where all of these other kind of um, striations radiate from. So that's our little fox sparrow who tends to just hang out for a few days um, in Northwestern Connecticut before moving on. And then we have our rusty blackbird um, who is defined by um, you know, not just the rusty coloration on the body, which is primarily where the bird does get its common name here, um, but the sound that the bird makes as part of its song also reminds a lot of birders of the swinging of a rusty gate. So let's give that a listen. <laughs> All right, so now let's go through a few birds that are here uh, during the spring and summer months, either as migrants or as residents. Uh, this bird is probably familiar to many of us because it does like to inhabit human-made structures. And when I say inhabit, I really mean it likes to build its nest on those structures. Um, so we oftentimes find this bird 
uh, on, on eaves. We find it um, hanging out in garages if they're left open frequently enough. I even have routinely a pair that comes to try to construct a nest atop of a light bulb, believe it or not, in my stairwell here at the Audubon Center. Um, so again, these birds just generally tend to favor human-made structures um, on which to build their nest, which is most often comprised of a mud base um, with lots of moss and then various strands of grasses that are woven into it. So really closely resembles a robin's nest. Um, this bird is uh, often seen on a conspicuous perch because as a member of the flycatcher family, it'll often um, stand at a perch like this adult is in the photo and it'll kind of sally out and perform some pretty impressive acrobatics to be able to catch various winged insects that fly by. And so you'll see it kind of twist and twirl in midair after these insects, and then it'll return to that perch and repeat that process until it's done feeding. This bird is an Eastern Phoebe, and I will go ahead and give you a little um, sample of the song that it sings because you can hear the common name repeated in its song, even though it's a very guttural sound. <laughs> we oftentimes think of the black capped chickadee as issuing that really sweet sounding Phoebe, Phoebe. Um, but let's give the uh, Eastern Phoebe song a listen and see how that differs. <laughs> kind of that deep baby, right? So not nearly as melodic, but a little bit more harsh and guttural. So here's a photo on the right-hand side of the young that look like they have just fledged the nest. Um, so again, this is a stage of development where we oftentimes get folks calling us about potentially abandoned wildlife, birds as fledglings. They find them on the ground and they think that maybe there is something wrong. But in most cases, there usually is not something wrong. And being on the ground is just a natural part of their development, right? The parents will usually continue to feed these birds on the ground for periods sometimes as long as up to two weeks before that bird is fully independent. So that nestling or that fledgling rather will issue begging calls. Mom and dad will be able to find it and um, they'll make sure that it's fed again until it becomes fully independent. This character is probably very familiar to most of you, our red-winged blackbird, right? And these males are defined by these bright red patches on the shoulders of the wing referred to as the epaulets, and they will flash them either to defend territory from other intruding males or to be able to attract a mate. But unlike other songbirds, um, this particular body part isn't really what attracts the female. Right? We tend to think of males as being really bright and flashy and having those colors attract the female, which is oftentimes very true. Um, and especially true if anybody, again, has seen um, documentaries on birds of paradise or planet Earth. You've seen all that wild footage of birds of paradise and just how spectacular those colors can be on those birds that really do woo the females. Um, but with our red winged blackbirds, what's really most impressive and important to the female is actually the overall quality of the habitat that that male procures. So studies have found that female red winged blackbirds will be willing to mate with a male who may already have as many as 14 different females on his territory. Yes, you heard that right, 14 different females. If his territory is over water, they will choose to mate with that male as opposed to a male who has zero mates but has a territory secured on land. Right? So it is more important to that female bird that she be over water so that that water provides a buffer to potential predators, a raccoon, an opossum, uh, most snakes, a skunk, especially all those mammalian predators um, can be a big threat to songbird survivorship. Right, And so again, having that buffer of water really knocks a lot of those predators just off the docket as being potential threats. So again, she's really willing to really share that male with all these other different females um, if she gets that quality territory. So when we're looking at the female red winged blackbird, um, I still, I will fully admit that I still will mistake this bird oftentimes for a sparrow species, for example, because it does just, it does just look like a sparrow, right? We see a lot of these camouflage markings. We see lots of browns and whites and earth tones that give us the impression that it might be a sparrow. But let's look at these arrows that I've put in here. First and foremost, we see a lot of the striping on the chest and on, um, or the breast and on the belly, right? So that stands out to us right away. We have this striping that is consistent from the throat all the way down, really to the base of the tail. 
Second, we have this eye line, um, or not an eye line, but this eyebrow, which is also referred to as a supercilium. You can also just say eyebrow, and that's perfectly acceptable. But we can see that there's this white line that extends from the top of the eye all the way back to the nape, right? The back of the neck. So that's another field mark to pay attention to. But then it's not, it's very subtle in this photo, but we can see kind of a little bit of a yellow coloration underneath the bill. So she has this really subtle yellow throat, which if we're close enough to the bird or we have good binoculars, we can be able to see that. And that might be another field mark that makes us say, yes, this is definitely a red winged blackbird that we're looking at, a female, right? And they're not as conspicuous as the males, especially at this point in their development in the season because they are busy rearing those babies um, in their nests that are usually deep within the reeds in that wetland habitat. And just for cakes, we'll go ahead and give this song a listen from the mail. <laughs> Very nice sound. And to me, that always indicates that spring is officially here when I start to hear those red winged blackbirds singing. How many of you guys have seen an American woodcock before? How weird are these birds? They are incredibly camouflaged. You can see that the camouflage is just kind of all over the place on this bird and it falls into a group of camouflage referred to as cryptic camouflage. Um, it really just helps um, kind of scribble up that pattern on the feathers so that predators can't detect the shape of the bird as well. These birds spend a lot of time on the ground as they are using that really long bill to be able to forage for earthworms in the soil. Right, so don't let this bird seem kind of puny to you or ineffective. It is an earthworm's worst nightmare with that bill. We can see already there's some dirt clinging to the side. So this bird has probably been busy looking for those earthworms, right? But again, as it's foraging on the ground and especially as a female is sitting on the nest on the ground, um, this pattern does really help to confuse the silhouette of that bird and hopefully make her invisible and undetectable to predators. Um, this bird does breed in northwestern Connecticut, and in the springtime, if you do go out to any open field or pasture where there's a nice forest that borders that space, um, you might see the male displaying, which involves some really spectacular um, aerial movements and then dives back down to the ground. We're going to see a little bit of this in the next slide here. Um, it doesn't so much include the aerial piece, but it includes, includes some of the ground movements that this bird does before it flies up into the sky and does a lot of these pirouettes. Actually, the sound that we're hearing when the bird is in flight is actually the sound of air uh, moving through the bird's primaries, which gives off this very distinctive sound, which makes us believe that the bird is giving some kind of call from its mouth or its throat, but it's actually, again, the sound generated by this wing. So let's take a look now at the um, part of the display, uh, courtship display that our male does for females in late winter and early spring here in the state. Yes, if you guys could hear that, I tried to share my sound with you and really pump the sound out, but it gives these little beat, these nasally painting calls as it rotates in that circle <laughs> before taking off again into those really nice aerial displays. Um, this was footage captured from our Greenwich Audubon Center by naturalist Ryan McLean down there. Um, and again, you have to really be able to stay out um, really until the sun sets to be able to hear those distinctive painting calls and then to be able to hopefully catch the last light um, to be able to see them go into those aerial displays. Um, but these birds are migratory. They're really not much bigger than a robin and fly all the way down to the southeastern United States to spend the winter before coming back up to us. All right, I'm trying to advance here and it's not letting me. Okay, there we go. All right, so now, so we've talked about a couple of songbird species. We've talked about this ground dwelling bird. Um, so let's take a look at a species of waterfowl here. Um, we have a very charismatic and just, gosh, utterly stunningly beautiful wood duck one of the um, duck species that we can find here in Northwestern Connecticut. And this is a really unique one, uh, first of all, because of the male's pretty much entire palette of coloration that you can find on the body, right? 
I mean, the plumage as a field mark alone is so distinctive because we do not find this kind of coloration on any other duck species that inhabits the state. So right away, we have that, again, alone as a field mark that puts this duck apart from others. Um, but again, when we're talking about plumage as a field mark, we have this distinctive crest that this duck bears, both on the male and, as my arrow indicates here, on the female bird. Right, so even when we see the much more camouflaged female here in the right hand side of the photo, um, all we need to do is really just look to see the presence of the shaggy crest and we can know right away that that is a wood duck without really having to go much further and explore other field marks. Um, one field mark regarding plumage too that we look at with our wood duck in the clinic is when we look at the young, we look at the presence of this eye line here. Right, so the way to tell these apart from mallard duck Links. This is a little pro tip for you guys, is that with wood ducks, this line does not go all the way through the eye to the base of the bill. If it were a mallard, which we'll see later in the presentation, you'll see the continuation of this line. This line only extends from the back of the eye to the back of the neck. And again, when somebody brings us ducks, um, because babies do get abandoned sometimes, if mom is crossing a road or you know, a part of the woods, a duckling might fall behind or get lost. Um, so when they come to us, we need only really to look at the presence of this eye line to be able to tell apart wood ducklings from mallard ducklings. But if we hear this duck, and I've startled this duck on hikes many a time when I come up to ponds and I don't see them, um, the female will oftentimes give this call um, in alarm as she flies away. So if you guys have heard that before, but haven't seen the bird that's been issuing it, again, that is the alarm call of the wood duck. And they're really kind of interesting as a nesting species because they aren't actually cavity nesters. And believe it or not, it may seem unusual to consider a duck as a cavity nester, um, but they will look for, um, again, um, rotted wood, snags, um, any sort of tree that has a sizable enough cavity um, for that female to be able to lay her eggs in and then rear her young. And the babies are so resilient that they'll really just within a day of hatching, they will jump right out of that cavity and onto the forest floor. And so if you guys are looking for some pretty amazing footage and a little bit of entertainment, perhaps I highly recommend just YouTubing, doing a search for those babies plunking out of the cavity because they are built again so resiliently that they can withstand the impact jumping out of those cavities and then following mom to that water body. Um, to help these birds increase, since they were um, very heavily hunted in this region in generations past, um, we have put up a lot of nest boxes for them. And so if you see large boxes situated out in a pond or a small lake, um, those are likely wood duck boxes. And a couple more birds to take a look at here. We have um, our yellow-bellied sapsucker, a member of the woodpecker family here in the state. Um, and this is a special species because this species of woodpecker is actually migratory. And so again, these guys are hanging out in parts of the Southeast in Northern Mexico during the winter months, and then flying back up to us to spend the spring and summer and breed up here in our woodlands. Um, we really have these birds most predominantly in the Northwest corner of the state because of the health and predominance of these mixed forests, which they like. Um, so right now, actually, um, we can hear a lot of begging calls that are being uh, emitted by the young in those cavities as they are uh, not quite independent and are waiting food deliveries from mom and dad who cooperatively rear the young together. And so if you hear just a lot of chatter uh, that sounds like it's maybe nearby you in a forest and you can't identify the source, I encourage you to stick around for a little bit and try to see if you can find that cavity opening and maybe one of these parents scaling up the bark of the tree to be able to make a food delivery to those young. Uh, these uh, woodpeckers, when we look at them, uh, differ from other species, um, especially in the general appearance and the feathers of the female, which kind of looks washed out, right? Um, in our hairy woodpeckers and in our downy woodpeckers who also display this combination black and white plumage, um, you can see that that's really muted in the female of the yellow-bellied sapsucker and really just kind of brownish. Um, but what really sets the male apart um, is the presence of this very bright red throat. Um, so again, that's uh, pretty distinctive within woodpeckers in general in this area is that bright red throat, but it especially sets apart the male from female in this particular species. Um, and even though the yellow belly isn't entirely conspicuous in these birds, we can see a little bit of the wash again especially helpful when we see them close up, but if we have some good binoculars, we can usually see that too. Oh, 
And let's take a listen actually to their drumming before I fast forward because their drumming is actually uh, distinctive when we're talking about song. Uh, so woodpeckers, as they don't have a song that they sing, their drumming is what we can think of as their song. And if we get really into identifying woodpeckers and distinguishing them from one another, um, we can actually start to memorize their song and then have us that uh, have that be a key indicator as to who's who within the woodpeckers. Right, so it kind of sounds like a little bit of like Morse code tapping. No other woodpecker emits that kind of drumming pattern. So we hear it starting out fast doo -doo 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 and kind of tapering off at the end of this highly distinctive, again, of our yellow-bellied sapsucker. All right, and our last bird that we're gonna profile really quickly, because I know we're kind of running short on time here, is our American kestrel, All right? So figured we've covered waterfalls, songbirds, ground dwelling birds. We have to, of course, feature a bird of prey here. Um, and this is one of my favorites in the region. I love these small but tough and hardy falcons. American kestrels are the nation's smallest falcon species and are really about the size of a blue jay, right? So pretty tiny. But they do perch pretty conspicuously on telephone wires, for example, overlooking really open habitats like fields and meadows and pastures where they're looking for large insects like grasshoppers and cicadas, um, in addition to small rodents like white-footed mice and meadow voles. Uh, so this picture on the left-hand side here is of some pretty adorable, albeit, albeit very unhappy nestlings that we pulled from one of the American kestrel nest boxes that Sharon Audubon helps to monitor. Uh, so as part of our research and monitoring here at the center, um, we assist a gentleman by the name of Art Gingert, who um, some or many of you might know as he's been uh, really important in bird conservation and education here in the region for many decades. Um, so Art monitors about 60 boxes in Northwestern Connecticut. And we, through the help of a land manager, who Mike Dudek, whose hands are featured here, help monitor about 18 of those boxes. Um, so we clean them before the adults come back from their wintering grounds in Central America and the Southeast United States in early spring. Uh, we monitor them. We ban the young eventually to be able to see, um, you know, movement of kestrels and, and try to see if we have a lot of surviving young, see how many fledged at the end of the year. Um, and then, of course, we clean those out at the end of the year. Um, but again, yeah, just part of our work here at the center um, on a really special species of bird that has been found to have been in decline over the past several decades, uh, probably due to two factors that we can see so far. Um, one is the disappearance of the habitat that they prefer, which again is um, you know, open spaces, which are really attractive for conversion into other spaces, right? Fields become parking lots, become condo units, become shopping malls, that sort of thing. Um, so with the elimination of those habitats um, just has caused this bird to decline pretty significantly across its range in the US. Um, but in addition, because it eats so many insects due to its small size, um, we're really starting to see the impact of chemicals used by large agricultural operations. Um, so when that food source is poisoned, we see young that are oftentimes underweight and not properly developed by the time that they fledge, um, which causes them um, most often to have a uh, lesser rate of survivorship, uh, which is also pretty low for American kestrels due to their size and due to just all the things that they have to learn within that first year of life. And um, we see this bird having about an 80% uh, mortality rate within its first year without, um, you know, being underweight to start life off of. So these birds have it pretty difficult already. Um, but I have my little arrow here when we talk about differentiating the adults. Uh, the adult male has this really beautiful blue-gray head and wings here, right? And if we were to be looking at a female, she would instead be covered in this cinnamon brown coloration with these black bars. So just a really attractive falcon, in my opinion, with both the male and the female. Um, and that's not oftentimes something we see with that sexual dimorphism or difference in physical appearance between male and female. Um, usually we're telling bird of prey species apart by looking at the size and the female is almost always larger than the male. So again, that's something that makes kestrels unique in the bird of prey world is that they have an actual visible difference in coloration and in plumage. So I, again, I know we're running short on time, so I'm gonna kind of speed through these next slides as we talk a little bit about how we can help these birds at home, right? We know now when we're talking about food that we shouldn't have our bird feeders up during the summer months because of this mysterious illness that we have going around in the Eastern United States. So we are going to focus on um, a few different plants that we can put in our yard to help birds. 
Of course, when we provide water for them, um, we do help to provide a source of hydration, but we also help provide um, a source for birds to be able to cool off in and to be able to really kind of clean their feathers and maybe get some potential parasites off of. Um, when we provide native plants, we might also be providing shelter for them too, whether that's tree species or shrubs or grasses, right? Birds can seek shelter in all of those things. And also when we provide those types of vegetation, we provide nesting sites, which overall these features combined provide really good habitat, high quality spaces for birds. So when we are talking about bird food, a lot of the times at Audubon, we are talking about the thing that you see in this slide, these really nice, juicy caterpillars. Maybe not this particular caterpillar because this does belong to a rather large silk moth, a cecropia moth. Um, and this is a pretty big handling item for a lot of small uh, bird species uh, to be able to put into the mouth of their babies. But this is really overall what we're talking about when we're talking about providing high quality food is about abundance of insects. So if there was one text that I could recommend that everybody have in their homes, it's this wonderful book called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. He is a world renowned entomologist out of the University of Delaware, and he and his team have really began thoroughly studying these evolutionary relationships between birds, insects, and native plants. And ultimately what he has concluded thus far is that the more native plants we have in our landscapes, uh, the more insects that we have. And the more insects we have, the healthier our birds are. So it really all ties together in that way. When we look at this particular table here, um, we can see um, just how many species of insects these trees support. So if we look at this, this is astounding. Look at the oaks and the willows in the 400s in regards to native insects that they support. And as we're gonna see quickly here, as I speed through these, that can be um, various species of moths, that could be beetles, that could be butterflies, but we're really predominantly talking about lepidopterans, uh, butterflies and moths, and all those different caterpillars that can be supported by these different trees. Um, so oaks, as you might've seen in that table, are at the very top, right? They are really the champions when we're talking about planting for birds because they can host over 400 different species of butterflies and moths in them, right? So two common species here are white, and northern red oak um, that have just evolved in these forests here and that are really excellent species to consider incorporating into our landscapes um, because of those uh, lepidopterans that they support. But if we look at these trees um, as grown specimens, you can see that they provide all those other uh, elements of quality habitat too, like shelter and nesting sites for birds too, right, that are really important for birds in various stages of development. So sugar maples are another great native species that we consider uh, can consider incorporating into our landscapes because it supports um, over 200 different species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. One of my favorites, and maybe one of your favorites too, being the rosy maple moth, this lovely little moth here in my photo. Uh, the Norway maple is a non-native invasive maple um, that is European and that was imported here during the 1700s really as a, an ornament. Um, and so it actually does not support any native lepidopterans. And so it is really not useful to birds in that respect. It does really not provide them any sort of high quality food when they're feeding the young. So we really do not encourage folks to plant Norway maples, but instead uh, encourage you to opt for sugar maples or red maples. Um, so if we are uh, incorporating shrubs into our landscapes, we might consider incorporating plants like winterberry and spicebush and serviceberry and elderberry and, and even these ones that we're familiar with harvesting berries from, our raspberry and our blueberry. It can be high bush blueberry or low bush blueberry. Um, these are really helpful to um, bird species like our cedar waxwing in the left-hand side of the slide who almost exclusively feed on berries during the summer months when they're here. Right? They do breed here in Northwestern Connecticut. And again, they would be visiting all of these burying bushes um, as again, they're really surviving predominantly on those berries during the season. Um, but when we're talking about birds that are migrating and that are really needing to put on a lot of calories and fat to help fuel them on those long distance journey, this hermit thrush passing through Northwestern Connecticut in the fall and in the spring, in the fall especially, really benefits from the presence of those berries as a source of both of those things to continue its journey. Right, and as I mentioned, you know, bushes like holly and other types of native vegetation can really help resident birds like our American robin, very hardy, be able to tough out these cold and, um, you know, pretty harsh winters here in New England. 
uh, Virginia creeper as a vine is another native species that we can consider incorporating. It does fruit in the late summer and fall and puts out all sorts of berries that um, over 30 different native species of birds will feast on. Um, porcelainberry, eh, eh, I should put a big X over that. Uh, that is a non-native invasive too, which even though it does have these beautiful pastel colored berries, um, does not belong here and is actually banned outright from cultivation in the state of Massachusetts because it just spreads so readily and really smothers all of the native vegetation underneath it. All right, we can see a couple of uh, species of lepidopterans that Virginia creeper supports. And again, porcelainberry being a non-native invasive does not support any native species of caterpillars. And so again, it does a disservice to birds in that way too. A couple of flower species that we can consider. And I'm, of course, I'm sorry, I'm going through this kind of quickly as I'm trying to wrap up here for folks. Um, Joe pieweed, another excellent species that supports over 20 different species of butterflies and moths, um, both uh, through its leaves and then um, helps provide nectar as does the purple cone flower too for those insects as adults like the pearl crescent. Right, so ultimately the message here with these native plantings is to be able to help support bird populations by giving them lots of juicy insects to make sure they're young, have all the nutrients that they need, right? So we wanna see more of this in our homes and in our backyards and in our natural environments, right? These parents bringing these healthy insects to their young so that they might grow up and successfully fledge the nest and hopefully then contribute to the overall population as adults. Right, so here are a few more things that folks can do at home to help birds. If you are interested in seeing which plants might be suitable for your area here in Northwestern Connecticut, we always encourage you to go to Plants for Birds on Audubon's website. Um, their database is so sophisticated that you can actually type in your zip code and hit enter and it will generate a comprehensive list of flowers, shrubs, and trees that are suitable for this particular region that you can put into your yard if you're interested. Not only that, it'll also give you suggestions of where you can purchase those plants at native nurseries near you so that you can get your hands on them. We do uh, suggest that people really limit and ultimately eliminate their usage of chemicals so that our Eastern bluebirds and other native species can have lots of juicy caterpillars that are not tainted to be able to feed their babies during those months, uh, spring and summer, and that folks keep their cats indoors too. I know this is a particularly contentious topic, but we know from the research that cats do uh, kill billions of birds annually when they are allowed to be outdoors. And so to help keep our birds safe and keep their young thriving, again, we do encourage folks to keep them indoors, right? And window collisions, we get a lot of those patients in our rehab clinic. So Feather Friendly is a company that we have been promoting lately that makes really attractive yet very subtle decals that you can put on your window to help deter birds from colliding into that glass. Right, and I'd be happy to take any questions about our wildlife rehab clinic at the end of the presentation, which I promise we're getting there in just a second, um, as this is a very unique feature for our particular center. We are only one of two Audubon centers in the United States that has a wildlife rehab clinic as part of its operations. And so as you can see in the slide, we do specialize in chimney swifts, which are um, have bred and are rearing young now. So if you do have chimney swifts that have fallen, please give us a, give us a call because we really are um, the people to be able to take chimney swifts in the area. Um, we do also take waterfowl, ducks and geese that people find, and all manner of songbirds and raptors. So please do not ever hesitate to give us a call if you find injured or orphaned wildlife. Thank you everybody for your patience as we wrapped up a little bit late today. Um, but at this point, I would be more than happy to take any questions that folks have about um, birds ID or um, anything else that they have on their mind. Again, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Bethany. Um, the, first, the first question that came up in the chat early on was a question about bird feeders mm. and squirrel um, fear of, um, wanting to put up bird feeders, but wanting to deter squirrels. So do you have any advice on that? Oh, sure. Uh, so we tend to recommend that when people are putting up bird feeders, I know that um, from personal experience that squirrels can be quite a pest. Um, so try situating it about 10 feet away from any tree or shrub. Um, you've probably seen, if, you try, if you've tried moving your bird feeder around already, that squirrels can leap pretty far. Um, so at about 10 feet, that's about where their limit is. Um, we still do like to have bird feeders close-ish to that kind of protective cover because if a bird of prey or another predator does come into the vicinity, um, it's good to have places so those birds can like dive into and seek cover right away. So 10 feet tends to be about the sweet spot so that squirrels can't jump onto the bird feeder, but that birds still have access to that shrub or you know that tree to be able to 
um, seek shelter should they need to if a cooper's hawk is in the area, for example. Um, you might also put baffles up on your feeder too, and those come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, and I've used those before with a lot of success as I had a lot of squirrels that were coming up from the ground and then just climbing right up the pole and getting into my feeders. So again, baffles can be really helpful too. So a question from Linda is, do you have any tips on how to identify birds of prey overhead when they're mostly in silhouette? Oh, yeah. So uh, let me think. So usually a good guide, so if you have a, um, a good guidebook, uh, like a Ken Kaufman's guidebook to field guide to birds of North America, or um, uh, what's the other sin, a Roger Tory Peterson guide, usually with birds of prey, they will give you a view in that guide of um, the underside of the wing, because it can be so tough to be able to pull those birds apart when you're looking at them from that angle. Um, so oftentimes we will see um, distinctive markings on the other side of the wing. But another important feature to pay attention to too is the general shape of the wing. Um, because we do have a couple of different shapes within our birds of prey. Um, if they're buteos, which is what a red-shouldered hawk or red-tailed hawk is, you're gonna see a really bulky wing as compared to an occipiter, like a cooper's hawk or a sharp-shinned hawk, which is gonna have a much more narrow wing um, built for a little bit different um, uh, activities. And so again, a good guide will usually have the undersides of that wing listed, um, but you might also pop onto websites too, like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, would probably be your most comprehensive site to be able to look at those particular field marks for birds of prey. Marie um, mentions that she um, also uses Merlin on her cell phone. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, and that's, that's. oh, I'm sorry. Was there another part of that question? No, no, just no, okay. sharing that information. Yeah. That's great. And I, I really would like to incorporate a slide here in the future that talks a little bit about um, community science and apps because Merlin uh, hosted by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a fantastic app for people to look at various field marks to try to identify birds in addition to the Audubon app. Um, both of those are free. So if you're looking for something handy so that you don't have to carry a field guide around, um, consider downloading those for sure. Um, you might also consider using eBird, um, which is really kind of the primary uh, community science database to be able to log uh, bird sightings when you're out in the field and even um, see uh, some kind of ID tips too. Uh, that's another good one, but that's more of like community science and entering data and things. Yeah, I don't see any more questions at the moment. So um, okay. I can wait a second to see if anybody- <laughs> Sure, <laughs> sure. But um, yeah, a lot of thank yous. So yes, great presentation and thank you very oh, much. Yes, Bethany. yes, yes. Um, yes. I, I have recorded this. I'm actually gonna stop it right now.